Uh, welcome to Beyond the Lab, a series by the Office of Career Development in the Biomedical Research, Education, and Training Department of the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt. I'm here today with Amy Moore, who was a postdoc between 2004 and 2008. So welcome, Amy. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you did while you were here at Vanderbilt. I was a postdoc in the lab of Scott Hebert, and we studied molecular mechanisms of acute myeloid leukemia development. So when I joined the lab, um, some of the other individuals in the lab were studying the role of myeloid translocation genes um, and what they did in terms of leukemogenesis. And we had some interesting phenotypes in the mouse model. And I ultimately went on to study the role of MTGs and went signaling and showed that they function as negative regulators um, of the canonical went signaling pathway. So what has your path been since Vanderbilt? Since Vanderbilt, um, so my path involves another person. I have a two-body problem. <laughs> my husband was also a postdoc here at Vanderbilt. And so about 2007, 2008, we started interviewing for academic faculty positions. And at the time, um, first of all, it was challenging with the two-body situation, but the NIH budget was already in a state of decline. So our you know journey took us around to various places, and it would be a situation where maybe one of us would get a good offer, but it wasn't as good for the other person. Um, and so along the way, while here at Vanderbilt, I'd also acquired some additional skills. I'd become president of the postdoc association and thought maybe I could use some of that additional expertise to serve me in some capacity. So eventually he got an offer at Emory University, and we realized that was a really good fit for his research interest. It was good, uh, a good fit for us geographically, both being from the South it was close to family, but there weren't really any faculty positions in Atlanta for me at the time. And so I started looking for other opportunities. And I wanted to stay connected to cancer since that had been my area of research. And just started Googling opportunities related to cancer in Atlanta and stumbled upon a nonprofit organization called the Georgia Cancer Coalition, which was created back in 2001 by then Governor um, Roy Barnes, along with Hamilton Jordan, who had been Jimmy Carter's chief of staff. And they really looked at the landscape in Georgia and realized that there were high disparities, there was a huge cancer burden in the state, and that we didn't have an NCI-designated cancer uh, facility. So they wanted to invest a portion of the tobacco settlement money that states received in the late 90s to try to address that. And so the Georgia Cancer Coalition was created um, out of that, and basically its mission was threefold. They helped recruit scientists. We um, invested in clinical trials. We helped create a statewide biorepository. And I um, basically looked at the organizational structure. They were very small, had only four people on staff, none of whom had a formal science background. So I felt like I could contribute to their mission and, and really play a role in being a liaison with those researchers and translating what they were doing to other constituencies and to the legislature that basically governed the funding for the organization. And so I contacted them um, and basically told them how I felt I could contribute to the mission and ultimately uh, landed a position as manager of research programs and ultimately became director of research programs overseeing their portfolio. Okay, so tell me more about that that role as a, the manager of the research programs. What exactly do you do? Yeah, so basically um, it was you know, a role in research administration, grants management. So part of our approach was to recruit faculty um, and their funding basically corresponded to their academic rank. So assistant professors would get 50,000 a year for five years, associates 100,000 and full faculty 150,000. So there was work around um, convening peer review committees, you know, screening applications, and then once award decisions were made, managing those grants for the five-year period. So, you know, I oversaw all aspects of that. In terms of our biorepository initiative, I provided administrative support to the individuals that were located at the Medical College of Georgia where the repository was centrally located, and also um, advocate for funding for the research programs for the repository. So there was a bit of grants management and then also kind of strategic planning, program building, um, and every year we would have to go before the State General Assembly and kind of demonstrate our results and progress and petition for additional funding for the following year. So um, it was a very kind of diverse job, but something that I found I enjoyed. Yeah. What does your typical day look like? Um, it, it's kind of, I guess, evolved over time. In the early days, I did a lot of this grants management piece. 
And then in fiscal year 2011, the governor merged the Georgia Cancer Coalition with my current organization called the Georgia Research Alliance. And that was partly due to the economic situation in Georgia. He was trying to achieve some, I guess, cost or some savings by merging the organizations, getting rid of some of the administrative overhead while focusing on the programmatic elements of what we do. And so now, in addition to continuing to oversee the cancer portfolio, um, GRA is much broader. We touch on um, biomedical research, but we also touch on com computing, communications, agriculture, and much broader. Um, and so I do a lot of strategic planning activities. Right now I'm involved in kind of a personalized medicine initiative, working with vice presidents for research at Emory and Georgia Tech. We're um, working on a core competencies assessment of the life sciences in Georgia. Um, so GRA's mission is similar to Georgia Cancer Coalition. We help recruit scientists across Georgia's academic universities. We help invest in major equipment purchases, core facilities, and then we also help commercialize discoveries coming out of the lab. So um, our current governor's platform is built around economic development, and so we try to approach science from an economic development viewpoint and are always thinking about how we can tell our story in a way that you know, tells an economic development story as well. Let's talk about skills. Your role, how, how does that fit with your skills that you have? You know, I think part of my strengths that I brought to this job are, you know, I'm really good organizationally. Um, I like to think about strategic planning, program building, kind of science advocacy. I certainly enjoyed doing bench science and um, had a great time at Vanderbilt as a postdoc, but I think I always approached my career in terms of being flexible, being resourceful, and trying to acquire additional skills along the way that I might be able to utilize in some other way going forward. Um, and part of that was practical, but part of that was also just following my own interest. And so by becoming president of the Postdoc Association here, you know, I really felt passionate about um, advocating for the postdocs, but then that also served me in allowing me to see some of the administrative um, goings on of the university and working on some medical center committees and seeing how things operate at that level. And I found that I enjoyed that kind of work as well. And um, so I think, you know, I've been able to utilize some of those experiences and, and um, organizational skills that we use in the postdoc association and, and just adapt that to my current career. Okay. Um, I know you had your postdoc here, but would you say that in your current role a postdoc was required or...? I'm definitely a purist in that regard, and I, I would tell everybody that they should do a postdoc regardless, especially if they're uncertain about their future, um, because I think there's a certain level of maturation that goes on, and certainly with the research portfolio that I ever see now, it's very broad, it's very diverse, and so, you know, my PhD is in microbiology and immunology, I trained as a virologist, I then moved into cancer research for my postdoc, but I draw on all of that for my current position. Um, and so I think it's even more critical in this day and age with NIH funding going down for people to get that additional training because you're competing against people that have that, if not more. Um, so to be competitive in this market, I think you have to do it. But it served me well because it's given me maturation, exposure to more science, and I, I use all of that. Okay. What are some of the skills that you had to gain after you left Vanderbilt? Um, you know, I did have to learn kind of the grants management piece, and that wasn't hard. There were, you know, different databases we utilized, and that was easy to pick up. I think the one thing that I was least probably prepared for was the degree of politics involved in my role or in our organization's funding, for example, because the funding is allocated by the state, and there are politics that, that determine who gets funding every year. And and that's hard when, as a scientist, you see the need and you're passionate about research, but maybe you're trying to communicate that to a legislative body that, you know, the legisla legislators may or may not have that science background and may not recognize the importance of a long-term investment in research when there are other kind of short-term needs that they have to address. So that was one of my biggest challenges that took getting used to and figuring out how to communicate the work we did in a way that would resonate with people who may or may not understand the science. Um, but they did, for example, understand return on investment. We could talk about the additional grants 
that our researchers were able to bring in because of the state's investment in them. And, and that did resonate well um, with them, so. Great. What would, um, what extracurriculars or different programs would you encourage trainees to pursue while they're here at Vanderbilt? I think it varies for each person according to their own interests. I mean, certainly in my case, you know, I had this interest in getting involved with the postdoc association, but I think regardless of the path you're considering, I would definitely advise people to try to find like people in those career paths and, you know, shadow them or look for an internship or get involved with an organization like the PDA and, you know, try to get some exposure. It's really hard to know if a career is the right fit until you until you see it or you, you experience it. And so, you know, regardless of what your mentor may say, like actively seek out those opportunities and take advantage of them. Okay. What are some of the real steps that you took to get your current job? So some job search advice. Yeah, so my story was a little bit um, interesting because like I say, when my husband got the opportunity to go to Emory, we knew that was the right fit. And so I kind of focused my search on Atlanta specifically stumbled upon this organization, was very interested in um, potentially working for them. So looking at the organization's website, I didn't see the president's email address, for example. And But I kind of figured it out based on everybody else's email address. So at first I sent an email um, and it bounced back. And then I kind of determined that maybe instead of going by William, the president would go by Bill. And so I sent an email to btodd at georgiacancer.org. And um, actually it went through and one thing led to another and I got an interview and there was also a bit of serendipity involved because my predecessor um, as director of research programs had just left the organization to take a consulting position. So they had a vacancy that they hadn't even advertised yet. Um, and, you know, so I went and interviewed and of course they at first thought I was overqualified and wondered why I wanted to leave the bench. and. Um, but then they ultimately saw that I felt I could be more impactful in influencing cancer outcomes for an entire state of people um, and, and have a greater impact that way than maybe I could at the bench. Because I you know, looked internally and realized that maybe I'm not going to be that person to make that huge discovery at the bench, but maybe I can um, do this other activity or line of work that can you know, have a positive influence. Um, so a lot of people define networking differently. How would you define networking? I think, you know, a lot of networking occurs at conferences. I still attend conferences. I still attend the annual AACR meeting, one of the largest cancer meetings there is. You know, in my various meetings across universities, um, I definitely take advantage of LinkedIn and try to connect with any individuals I meet along the way. Um, so I think those are probably my two biggest ways of networking, just going to conferences. And then as I meet people in meetings, you know, staying connected. Okay, so what do you wish you knew when you were a postdoc that you know now? Um, I think there's always the, the fear or the the anxiety about how is this going to work out. And, you know, it's nice to be on the other side and realize that we both did find the right job and the right fit for us, and it did work out. And, you know, as you're kind of considering the next step in your career, there's a lot of fear um, and just the unknown and the inability to plan. But I think if you try to be flexible and be resourceful and, and be prepared, then it will work out. So... Um, so tell me about your work-life balance. <laughs> um, I would say that's been the best thing about making my job transition um, because my husband has a lab, and that is a very big thing to get off the ground. As junior faculty, he's done really well. He got his grants, you know, um, were funded very early on, whereas I have a more normal structure now. Um, as a postdoc, we were here, you know, seven days a week, all kinds of hours, and so I'm much more Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of thing. And my current boss is very supportive of working women and families, and so it has afforded us a lot more balance and flexibility, which has, you know, just been a tremendous blessing. Um, and so we do have kids, and we make it work. You know, there are days when it's crazy, and we don't know how it's going to happen, but um, we do figure it out. Okay. 
Do you have a favorite experience from your Vanderbilt experience from your Vanderbilt time that you'd want to share? Um, I was trying to think about that, and there's not one particular thing that comes to mind. I just look back on my days at Vanderbilt, you know, very fondly, and we had a great time here, and loved Nashville, and made great lifelong friends, and you know, we would never hesitate to come back. So, it, it was just a great period in our lives. So, what words of wisdom would you have for current? PhDs and postdocs. Um. I think it's important to you know really do soul searching and look at yourself and do an honest assessment of what your skills and strengths are and you know lay aside your ego, lay aside any fear that you may have about being honest with your PI and really think about what you're good at and what would make you happy and how can you make that happen and how can you you know contribute meaningfully, um, but utilize your training at the same time. And I think once I was able to do that, then, you know, doors opened for me that maybe I didn't even know existed. But in the end, it all worked out, and it's been a, a good a good fit. So Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate oh, thank you for having, having you.